see several of them took place in this magnificent, historic stadium on the outskirts of Los Angeles. Of course, the countdown has already begun for the 2006 FIFA World Cup that's going to take place in Germany. And so we thought it would be fun to do a countdown of our own as we look back on the top 10 moments in American soccer history. We'll show you how the most famous player in the sport was lured to this country and the impact that he had on jump-starting the world's number one sport here in the United States. We'll look back at an American team that stunned the soccer world more than a half century ago. And we'll reveal how women's soccer burst onto the scene in a big way. Speaking of which, I am delighted to be joined by Heather Mitz, who led her Florida Gators to the national championship before joining the women's national team that won the gold medal in Athens. She also played professionally for the Philadelphia Charge and is now a soccer broadcaster and internet columnist. Heather, welcome. Thank you. It's such an honor to be here with you. And obviously, congratulations on your nomination to the U.S. Soccer Hall of Fame. Oh, you're too kind. But as I tell everybody, there is absolutely no accounting for bad taste. Anyway, Heather, as a player and a reporter, you know that U.S. soccer hit it big in recent times with the Olympic competition. So we'll begin our countdown with the number 10 and number 9 top moments in U.S. soccer history. It's over! The United States has won the first ever gold medal in women's soccer 2-1! I think losing in 95 to Norway in the semifinal um, was something that was probably the best thing for our team. You know, I hate to lose. I know every single person on our team at that time hated to lose. Um, but I think it was probably the best thing for us because, you know, you, you go back after that and, and we had a big tournament and we had the Olympics in 96 coming up and, you know, you sort of reevaluate yourself and you reevaluate your team. We went too hard. We exerted too much. We, we were burnt out by the time we got to the World Cup because we had lived together in a residency six months together. And what we learned from that is, you know what, it's not, you know, how many hours you put in and how hard you work. And especially as you're getting older and evolving, it's it's what you're doing with that time. You know, how smart you are, what you're learning. You know, and then you get the, the taste in your mouth of losing, and you know you don't ever want to do that again. That was kind of like the springboard to the next training session, which probably wasn't for months, but when we came back together, we're going to remember that. Norway's not getting another sniff of the, you know, Germany's not going to win this game. And it became personal. They lost the World Cup in 95, which was a bitter blow, but they won the Olympics in 96, and that was a very big moment. That was a huge moment. That was almost like the 94 World Cup, in a sense, for the importance of soccer in this country. To go down to Norway what, like we had in 1995, the difference is in 1995, there was this like, oh gosh, can we come back from this? 1996, we walked in at halftime, we were like, we're fine. There was a noticeable difference. There was an edge to everyone in terms of, uh, um, all right, are, are you going to help me get better today? Because I'm going to help you get better today. And we're going to push each other. I think we just learned about each other over time. We went through marriages, children, death, divorce. Um, I mean, we've gone through everything together. I mean, what else could bring you closer. There's not many other things in life. It is the end of an era for Mia Hamm, Joy Fawcett, and Julie Fowdy. The 2004 Olympics was big for the women. Unfortunately, the men didn't qualify. But on the women's side, we knew that this was going to be a last hurrah for some of the veterans. And I can remember, I had a couple young kids that were trying to get on the roster, uh, uh, Heather O'Reilly and Lindsay Tarpley. And I remember actually discussing uh, with both of them and emailing them that, uh, you know, whatever you do, I mean, if you've got to kill yourself to send these kids out on top, by all means do everything you can. Heather O'Reilly scored the goal in the semifinal uh, from an assist from Mia uh, to get them into the, uh, the gold medal game. And then Lindsay Tarpley, you know, scored a long-range goal uh, to help us beat Brazil 2-1 in the gold medal game. But to have them retire as gold medal winners uh, you know, uh, two-time Olympic champions, two-time world champions. I mean, that's a resume that's just absolutely extraordinary. To me, what's most memorable is it was so hard, you know. It was a really good Brazil team. It was a tough year living together uh, with the team and away from spouses and loved ones and so forth. And, and having done that for 17 year, years, knowing this is the end of the road, uh, it was neat to, to just walk away and, with a smile and a gold medal around your neck. That's two moments down and eight to go. When we return, you'll see the player they called the Black Pearl and how he brought his magic to the American soccer scene. 
when we continue on our countdown here of the greatest moments in American soccer, right after this. American Soccer's 10 Greatest Moments on ABC Sports, brought to you by Mercedes-Benz. most clearly shows, after your visit in these countries, there has been a remarkable change in the standard of play and enthusiasm for football. And what were in those packages? You surely cannot expect us to believe that you were only handing over these boots. So it doesn't make sense. You come to Zoom first one. Welcome to football. Welcome back, everyone. Almost a decade after music industry mogul Sonny Warblin made a huge splash by signing Joe Namath to the New York Jets, another legendary music exec, Ahmet Erdogan, used the same star power formula in bringing soccer's greatest star, Pele, to New York as the crown jewel of the Cosmos franchise and creating the number eight greatest moment in American soccer. <laughs> was, in my view, the, uh, the single most important thing in the growth of American soccer. I mean, people who are around today involved in soccer can't appreciate just how barren it was back in the, uh, the pre pelle days or the pre-North American Soccer League days. When he came, of course, the team was not anywhere near the caliber that was required for a player like Pelé's uh, talent to play with. And uh, at, that, at that point, we started to acquire other players who would complement complement uh, the team. We were playing against Rochester, and play arrived uh, in a helicopter like Mana from Heaven. And of course, uh, you know, it was an exciting time for everyone. But the first the first game with him was really memorable. We we were playing against Dallas. It was a nationally televised game. Uh, it was the first time that most of us had, had played. We had practiced with Pelé a few weeks before, but it was the first time we'd really played with him. I mean, you couldn't get in there for love nor money. I mean, the, they were hanging from the raft, rafters. They were, you know, overlooks Triber Bridge, overlooks Downing Stadium. There were people lined all the way along Triber Bridge, never mind the trucks going by, lined there just to catch a glimpse of him. The importance of Pelé's arrival in the U.S. to finish his career here uh, was, I think, unprecedented in international sports, and it, it generated so much interest that everybody in America found out about the game and uh, its importance internationally. I think that had a great impact. It must have been in July of, of uh, 77, we were playing Minnesota, and suddenly it just swarmed. I was standing looking out over the parking lot at Jai Stadium. I mean, and people were coming from every direction. I think we had 65,000 or something that day, which then grew to, into the, uh, the capacity crowds. I don't know, quite a dozen in a row of 70 odd thousand people. And kids all over America started to play soccer in schools and they idolized, they, their idol was Pelé. And I think that with the North American Soccer League having been around at least for a long enough period of time, it inspired an entire generation. No one globally uh, in any sport has had the impact that, uh, that, that Pelé's had. I mean, he has welcomed as no other player has ever been welcomed, he's still welcomed as if this man's walking on water, you know. But I think the fact that he, he enjoyed the game and played it at such a high level and appreciated every moment that he was on the field and it was visible to everybody that watched him. Ironically, to begin with, Pele was a distraction to the other players. Because as so many of them have said subsequently, said at the time, they didn't want to play with him. They wanted to sit on the bench and watch him. First of all, you, you definitely show up. There's no such thing as not showing up for a game when you're playing with Pelé. The flip side of that is everybody else on the opposing team shows up as well. 
every game that we played once Pelé arrived was for the other team the major game of the season for them and in some cases with some opposing players the game of, of their career. And I think that the, the end was almost as traumatic as the beginning. It was a rainy, rainy, dull, dark day, and I think that's what most of us felt as well. It wasn't just that he was leaving the Cosmos, which of course for most of the players and the fans was a very sad time, but the fact that he was retiring from, from soccer altogether. He spoke and talked about the things he believed in, peace and love, and, uh, and uh, it was a good message that he gave when, when he talked. And then when he played, miraculously, at his late age, he, he was able to score a beautiful goal. Uh, the great thing was that we were able to uh, you know, put him up on our shoulders and, and run him around the stadium one last time, and, and uh, he left the game the way he, he deserved to leave the game as a champion. Every kid, girl or boy, growing up in the post-Pele grassroots soccer boom, wanted to be able to dribble, run, and shoot like the legendary Brazilian superstar. But the women's game is a relatively recent phenomenon. And for the U.S. women's team, the breakthrough came in 1991. That was the year in which the concept of a full year-round national squad was established. And the dividends of this major effort quickly became apparent, as we see in our number seven greatest moment in American soccer. For the first time in the history of American soccer, a U.S. team will play for a world championship. Actually, it was just um, going through a bunch of old stuff and kind of trying to organize my life, and I came upon some pictures from 91, and I thought, oh my God, <laughs> look at how young we look, number one, and uh, what a great time it was. For me at 19, you know, I'd, yeah, it was, you never thought it was just the beginning, but. For a lot of us, we, we hope we'd be around to be, experience something like this for, for years to come. The importance of uh, the 1991 World Cup for us in the United States is it established us as a world power in the women's game. I was there. I was one of the few. I think there were only five U.S. journalists there in China in 91. And um, seeing Michelle Aker score the two goals that she had and actually win the U.S. at World Championship for the first time, it was, it was, it was tremendous. I mean, it was a wonderful feeling. Going down to the last minute where, um, you know, Shannon Higgins serves that ball in and Michelle doesn't give up on it. You know, she just keeps tracking it and, and um, puts pressure on the, on the defender who passes it back and is able to intercept it. And, it, it seemed like an eternity for that ball to roll into the back of the net. We knew the World Cup was a big event, um, but I don't think we knew what it could be. And I think it kind of hit, a, hit home to us when we came home from China in 91 and no one was there but one reporter. We're like, ooh, maybe it's not that big. <laughs> we're not horrified or shocked or disappointed. It's, you know, oh, well, that's right, we're back in the U.S., so that's okay. You know, was it taken seriously in 91? No, of course not. But then again, we didn't know what we were doing either, so how could we ask everybody else to think so highly of women's soccer when we weren't even sure where we were going? We just lived in the moment because you, you didn't know what was going to happen the next day or what was going to happen the next year. This was the only time we were going to have this tournament. FIFA uh, sort of hid us away in China in a way because uh, they weren't sure what was going to happen. And China did a remarkable job. I guess no one told the Chinese that this wasn't uh, an important event because they came out to watch. We were in the bus and we were driving up to the stadium and, you know, there were all these bicycles lined up. And we're like, what is going on? And so we get in the stadium and it's just absolutely packed. I mean, probably 70,000 people. And so the sort of product that we put on the field was stunning for FIFA. And now they're going back thinking, you know what, this is a real event. This is something that we can market. This is something that can, can really sell because these women attack with a reckless abandon, no cynicism, none of this jersey pulling and you know, time wasting and none of the tactics of the negative aspects of uh, the elite game and on the men's side. And with just one, one idea, let's score goals. And if you look at each year that went on with every World Cup and Olympics after that, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And now we're still fighting. We're still trying to keep it going. And that's, that will be our goal, I think, for forever. <laughs>
There are six more even greater moments still to come, including an unexpected focus on women's lingerie and an American squad that played the game of their lives when American soccer's 10 greatest moments continues right after this.